We have an extremely eminent list of panelists. We want you to listen to them. We've got a couple of videos as well, so let's get started. Um, this session, as uh, you can gather from the title, we will discuss ways in which development partners can respond to the challenge of climate change and food security in Asia and the Pacific region. But before we start, I'm going to ask you a question. And I'll request my production team to uh, flash the question onto the screen. For that, you'll have to scan the QR code. I think by now you all must be very familiar with pigeonhole. So the question is, which region of the world has the highest number of malnourished, when I say malnourished, I mean hungry people? Is it Africa? Is it Asia? Is it Latin America and the Caribbean? Or is it Oceania? I can't see the answers coming in from here. Uh, team, are the answers coming in? Okay. All right. Well, the correct answer is indeed B, Asia. The 2022 statistics, which are the latest available from FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, show Asia at 402 million compared with Africa at 282 million. South Asia alone has more hungry people than Africa. All this to suggest we still have a long way to go and lots of work needs to be done. Complicating matters, ongoing geopolitical and economic shocks, along with impacts from climate change and natural resources degradation, are eroding development gains. Recognizing the need to counter food insecurity in the region, IFIs have made significant financial and technical contributions to the... At this point, I'll invite my ADB colleagues, Ching Feng and Garrett, to come and make their presentations. Uh, Ching Feng Zhang is the Senior Director, Agriculture, Food, Nature, and Rural Development. And uh, Garrett Kilroy is Principal Evaluation Specialist. Garrett will present some of the early findings from an evaluation he's doing on this uh, topic. So uh, first, uh, Ching Feng, and then uh, Garrett. Mr. Mohammed Ani, a distinguished panelist, and also one of the colleagues. Good morning. Uh, let me start with the progress of the 14 billion US dollars uh, for security ambition. Uh, in September uh, 2022, President Masai launched the 14 billion US dollars uh, food security package to ease the worsening food crisis, but also strengthen the food system resilience. By the last, end of the last year, ADB already committed 7.7 7 billion US dollars uh, uh, for security investment. In the last two years, we adopted the emergency responses measures to mitigate the impact of the major uh, shocks in many of the, our fragile economies or DMCs, including Afghanistan, Myanmar, Sri, Sri Lanka, Kyrgyz, Pakistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and also Mongolia. We also introduced the climate smart agricultural and the natural based solution to strengthen the food system resilience. For example, in Philippines, we have conducted the policy reforms to stabilize the rice prices. In this country, Georgia, we promote climate smart irrigation and also introduce a policy change, enhance the policy reform on sustainable oil resources management. ADB also programmed a billion US dollars in our paper in 2024 and 2025 to enhance climate food natural access while very low on schedule to deliver our commitment. Next slide. But looking ahead, one of the general factors for the food insecurity, climate change, natural loss, ongoing geopolitical 
economic shocks may throw place enormous pressure on a Asia very vulnerable fragile food systems. Again, half of the people in the world affected by hunger live in Asia. And the two billion people in this region lack like their health states due to the poverty or the high food prices. Next slide. One thing we want to highlight, Asia rather facing rice crisis. Rice prices only increased more than 40% in 2023. Rice prices already are eroding their purchase power for many of the people in the region, particularly poor families. And growing hair waves in Asia causes a lot of the countries rather make the situations worse. According to the study from Iwi, one degree de temperature increase will reduce the rice yields by 3.3% uh, on average. But uh, sometimes the rice is also the, uh, a, a contributor to the climate change. Rice is responsible for 10% of the global methane emissions. Rice production uses over 30% of the world irrigation water. If we're talking about the next 25 years, we need to increase the 25% of our rice productions. We really need to transform the current rice farming practice to limit climate change, conserve water, and also the enhance the environmental ecosystem. Next slide. For the first time in the history, while the leading international financial institutions get together in time for this February, we agree to coordinate among ourselves and also address the internet the climate through natural access. We also agree to adopt the five pathways to transform the global food systems in Asia and the Pacific. We have the five components. Number one is the emergency responses mechanism, including the social assistance measures. Number two is uh, promote this uh, value chain approach to involve the all stakeholders activities from the farm to fork and also introduce uh, the uh, zero carbon uh, food system transformation. Number three is uh, to shift agricultural subsidy, support the natural basis solution and the climate agriculture, including sustain sustainable farming, rice farming practices. Number four, is to increase the investment in the low network and also poor facilities addresses the supply chain disruptions. Finally, we need to promote nutrition security. This includes the nutrition education, nutrition labeling regulations, and also the four refetications and the diversifications, and same time we also enhance food safety. So let me just pause here and again, we're going to take on to reflect what has worked and what we should improve. Gary, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ching Feng, and uh, good morning, uh, Minister, uh, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'll provide some messages based on an evaluation we just circulated to the board and we'll discuss at our Development Effectiveness Committee later this month. It's on Rural Development and Food Security, or OP5 for short, um, and it's one of ADB's seven operational priorities under Strategy 2030. Next slide, please. ADB has worked in this space for, for many decades. If, if those of you who've been to Manila, if you look at our front gate, you'll see the old symbol of, of ADB with the sheaf of rice, and that kind of hints to our, 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 our work in this, early work in this area. Um, but the issues are, are the same today, and you've seen the statistics. Asia has the largest number of un undernourished people based on the latest UN report. So next slide. So ADB's work on, on OP5, Rural Development and Food Security, it aims to achieve prosperous rural economies, reduce malnutrition, and provide food security for all. 
It does this through three pillars. You see that on the figure on, on the left. And I'll speak briefly on each and share some of our findings in this evaluation. The rural development pillar is where it, most of ADB's resources go, but it's diffusely spread across many sectors, and you can see the breakdown in sectors for the OP5 uh, portfolio. Some of the tagging of rural projects is, is quite mechanical, and sometimes there's less direct connection with uh, OP5 core objectives. On the positive side, uh, this is an area of engagement with a strong emphasis on climate resilience, and over half the portfolio of OP5 projects um, supports adaptation, which is much larger than, than bank-wide. Next slide, please. The second pillar focuses on agriculture value chain, and there was a notable uptick in investments over the evaluation period, largely driven by the agribusiness team at the private sector department of ADB. Direct involvement in, in agriculture value chain on the sovereign side was less common, but there is support provided on the enabling environment. There's no institutional approach for agriculture value chain in ADB, and in this slide we mapped ADB's agriculture value chain investments against a typology developed by researchers at Cornell University. As you can see, most of ADB's efforts is targeting the larger, more specialized firms with links to global value chain, and less on the more locally based tra traditional or transitional farms and firms. So an inst institutional approach is, like this is needed to map the entry points for sovereign and non-sovereign, and also to help foster cross-sector cooperation. Next slide, please. And then finally, we come to food security. Now, one issue with this pillar is that it was not well defined in the plan. And in the absence of a definition, we adopted FAO's four dimensions of food security. And we mapped all 240 projects using their results frameworks. And what we found is that about half of the portfolio supported at least one of these four dimensions. And the figure shows that ADB's greatest effort is on availability or the supply side product productivity. And least was on utilization, and most notably on, on nutrition. We also found that across the three pillars, actually they all support food security to varying degrees, and it's not limited to, to one pillar. Um, ADB supports food security through, obviously directly through agriculture, through rural roads, through access to rural finance, social protection, and even disaster risk reduction. And these all help support, support food security, and another reason for fostering cross-sectoral work. We also found that ADB's partnerships are critical to address weaker areas like nutrition and the knowledge gaps, like, such as better methodologies for tracking food security. So these are some of the issues raised during, during, during our evaluation, and I will hand it back to Saleha for the, for the panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Garrett. I'm sure uh, many of these uh, issues will come up in the discussion. Um, just to get the conversation started, uh, we'll showcase a short video with uh, some of the opinions that uh, matter from some of our stakeholders. So let's take a look at this very short video and then we can get started with the discussion. As we know, our food systems are struggling with climate and nutrition challenges, and the struggles hurt smallholder farmers the most. MDBs like ADB can continue to strengthen their investment in agricultural innovation. With these investments, IDB can help ensure a well-nourished, food secure Asia and the Pacific. For example, development of new flat torrent rice varieties has dramatically increased yield in flat bone areas. This has improved food security for millions. TGR just signed a five-year cooperation agreement with ADB to accelerate and scale innovation in the ag sector. ADB's partnership with entities like CGR and other businesses can really accelerate our evidence, innovation, and impact. We need to scale innovation, and to scale those innovation, we need sustained investment. So there are three things I think the uh, Asian Development Bank and, and all regional development banks can do to increase their impact on food security and good nutrition. First, disperse funds more quickly. 
All the reviews suggest that the disbursement is way too slow and in a food security and malnutrition crisis situation, speed is everything. Second, leverage the private sector. The private sector is really, really important for getting nutritious and safe food at a low price to people who really are at risk of not getting that food. Um, so whatever we can do to incentivize, de-risk, uh, first loss investments for the private sector is really important. And the third thing to do is to focus uh, development bank resources on the most vulnerable, uh, partly because they are the most vulnerable, but partly also preventing them from being food insecure and mal malnourished is an investment in the resilience of the whole system and a fantastic benefit cost ratio of 16 to one of, of doing so. So these are the three things the development banks can do. Disperse more quickly, leverage the private sector and focus on the most vulnerable. I think the MDBs can help with uh, improving uh, food systems, uh, making sure that both supply and uh, demand uh, side uh, interventions are uh, working for the, uh, for the communities. They can also strengthen uh, domestic transport infrastructures so that uh, remote communities are able to bring in their food supplies to urban centers and uh, you know, be able to sell them. They can also help with uh, research into resilience food crop. Women are, uh, you know, they are also highly impacted by all the, the changes that are uh, coming with climate change, but they are also very resilient. Their voices need to be heard in, in all these decision making when it comes to uh, climate change and all the, the impacts of climate change. Well, there you go. I think we are all set for the panel discussion now. Let me quickly introduce you to the panelists. Um, Honorable Abdul Hassan Mahmood Ali, Governor for Bangladesh in the Asian Development Bank and Minister of Finance of Bangladesh. So may I please request you to come onto the stage from the other side. Thank you very much for making time for us, Honorable uh, Minister. And then we have Glenn Denning. Uh, many of you would be familiar with Glenn's name. He's professor of practice at Columbia University, best-selling author, global leader in agriculture, food security, and sustainable development. Thank you very much, Glenn, for making time for us. We have Bertrand Wackener, deputy CEO of the AFD. Thank you very much for taking time for us. Purnima Menon, Senior Director, Food and Nutritional Policy at the International Food Policy Research Institute. And last but certainly not the least, ADB's Ramesh Subramaniam, Director General and Group Chief, Sectors Group. And today's session will be moderated by the Director General of Independent Evaluation Department at ADB, Emmanuel Jimenez. Manny, the panel is all yours now. Thank you very much, uh, Saleha, and welcome. Good morning, everybody, uh, to this beautiful uh, country, beautiful city, uh, for the uh, annual meetings of the ADB. And I'm very pleased to be able to uh, moderate this opening panel for the whole conference on uh, topics of really critical importance uh, for the country, for the region, and for the entire planet on uh, climate change and food security. You've heard the context very well uh, through the opening uh, few minutes. And let's just go right to the discussion from this very diverse group with different perspectives. Uh, Glenn, if I could uh, start with, uh, with you. Um, you've just heard ADB putting both food security and climate change as part of their operational priorities. You've just written a book with the subtitle, How to End Hunger While Protecting the Planet, uh, available and all in all good bookstores uh, in the world. Uh, let me ask you, uh, from your perspective, overseeing the whole uh, area, uh, what do you think uh, are the operational priorities really for institutions like the ADB, and how well positioned is the region to deal with these enormous challenges? Thank you, Manny. So I think the first thing to emphasize is that uh, Agriculture is very much affected, and the whole food system is affected by climate change. Uh, you know, whether it's the high temperatures, whether it's the floods, the droughts, the extreme events, 
the rising sea level and the salinity, uh, all of these things come together to impact uh, the food system, initially through agriculture, but extending you know, well, well beyond that. Now, our food systems across the world, across the Asia Pacific region, um, they've really evolved and adapted to different conditions. Uh, those conditions are now, you know, they've changed and, and our systems have to change uh, at the same time. So uh, I think investing in, uh, in, in food security and in the agriculture and food system is critical. And a lot of emphasis is being placed on resilience. And that's important, the ability um, to, to resist, to, to, to respond, uh, recover, reorient our food systems is important. But at the same time, we have to also think of productivity. We have to think of productivity and profitability because population continues to increase. Uh, 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 food uh, dietary demands uh, are changing. And many of our previously productive areas have, have actually degraded. So we have to still focus on innovation uh, to improve uh, productivity along with um, resilience. Now, the other side of the coin is, of course, agriculture and the food system is an important contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, right? So um, one third of all anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions come from the food system. Now, it's not all coming from agriculture. Some of it comes from land clearing, much of it does come from agriculture, but also post-harvest operations, including in food waste. So this tells us there are many opportunities within the food system and within agriculture to actually combat climate change. So you've got two, two sides of this. Now, is Asia ready? Is Asia prepared um, for this? I think, um, I think in broad terms, uh, yes, uh, but it varies from country to country. But I think what's you know, really critical uh, going forward is that we have to take a holistic approach. We can't just focus on the green revolution approach that was very successful in Asia in previous decades. We have to look right across the food system um, as, as, as was mentioned in the slides earlier. We have to look at intensification, market infrastructure, healthy diets, post-harvest management, and improved uh, social protection systems. So a much more holistic systemic, nuanced approach. Thanks very much, Glenn. Uh, Honorable Minister, uh, you heard uh, Professor Denning talk about uh, how he believes that uh, there's still, despite the fact that many countries in Asia are, are, are ready, uh, there are huge challenges ahead. I mean, Bangladesh is a country where both food security and climate change are really prime, of prime importance. What are the priorities uh, in your country right now, do you think, for addressing these issues? Well, I've been listening to him. I've been listening to It works. It works. It works. It works. It works. So I quite agree with him. The, uh, the way things have changed. And uh, I think uh, we are now... Uh, uh, quite some way uh, in meeting the new challenges that uh, he mentioned about uh, the uh, green revolution. So green revolution, yes, but uh, its time is uh, seems to be almost past. So now we have to deal with the uh, new challenges. And there I think uh, Bangladesh has shown the way that we have increased our uh, food production uh, now, only this increasing of the food production itself uh, will not work. In addition, we have to find uh, employment for our uh, uh, population which is uh, being added to the current population. And uh, at the same time, we have to find work for the uh, extra population. So the way to do it is, uh, as uh, he has mentioned, that... Uh, we have to bring in new elements in our uh, thinking, like uh, we have to find jobs for these people. And in addition, we have to uh, bring up, we have to, still we have to increase our production because uh, of the need to feed these extra mouths. So we are, uh, we, are we have done that. And uh, our uh, uh, leader, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, who is the, uh, now in her fifth term, 
um, as prime minister, and she has been uh, leading her people uh, to uh, uh, face the challenges, all these new challenges that are uh, that Bangladesh is facing. And she has shown how uh, this has to be done. And the uh, uh, the best part is that she has shown uh, that uh, Bangladesh can do it. And we have uh, the population is now uh, almost uh, 170, 170, 170 million. And despite that, we have uh, been able to uh, 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 meet the uh, challenges of uh, present challenges. That is, the uh, we have to increase the food production, uh, but the land is getting less and less. Uh, even then, we have we have done it. We have uh, under Sheikh Hasina's Bangladesh, uh, we have uh, been able to come out of this. Uh, uh, you know, the challenges faced by shortage of uh, need for uh, extra mouse, you know, to feed the uh, extra mouse. And at the same time, we have, uh, now we have, uh, we are, I think, third in uh, rice production, uh, which is a tremendous achievement. So that helps, helps to uh, uh, feed the extra population, and uh, in addition, we have to face the uh, uh, problem created by uh, problems created by uh, climate. So, climate uh, still is a factor, and uh, it has to be dealt with as such. So, that is exactly what we have been doing, and uh, this is why Bangladesh has come out of the uh, this. Uh, uh, problem faced, uh, problem created by uh, both sides. The one is the shortage of uh, production of food uh, and other uh, ancillary products, uh, vegetable, for example. So we have, uh, we are number three in rice production, despite the population growth. And then we are uh, also uh, number five or six in uh, the uh, uh, which is the uh, in other uh, uh, products like uh, we are uh, pursuing our uh, goals in fish production and now is one of the I think number four or five in uh, total fish fish production so which uh, so this what all this means is that uh, we have to carry our fight on all fronts, so which is uh, which is the experience uh, that Bangladesh has seen or gone through, and that is why Bangladesh has has been able to uh, come up with the fight, the our uh, uh, war, or call it whatever you call it. Yeah, it has really been a success. Th thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister. It's really valuable for this whole audience to see what it's like uh, on the ground in a country that is so critical uh, and on both issues. Uh, uh, Bertrand, you've heard uh, both speakers so far talk about uh, the need for innovation to, uh, while increasing productivity. All this is going to require money. Uh, from your perspective as a bilateral, but also your view internationally, uh, what are the top priorities and initiatives for trying to address these financing gaps in, a, in an innovative way? Thank you very much and uh, good morning, Mr. Minister, distinguished guests. Um, first of all, what strikes me while, while listening to um, the first two speakers and based on the experience that we've been having at uh, IFD together with uh, ADB, is the variety of responses that have to be built to address food security and the climate change threats that are posed to food security. As an example, in Dominican Republic where we work, it means finding new ways of driving agricultural techniques into the country and transforming agricultural techniques into uh, public policies in agriculture. We focused in this country, as an example, into on cocoa production and coffee production. 
and see how coffee production in forests can be uh, conducted, right? Preserving part of the trees that are in this forest and bringing revenues to farmers. Um, in Georgia, where I arrived the last Monday, I visited a farm on uh, Tuesday morning, and it was interesting to see how bringing genetics from uh, French cows, as an example, has enabled the farmers there to double their milk production in just uh, two or three years. And uh, in uh, Bangladesh, Mr. Minister, where, where we concluded a partnership agreement with your country and with yourself, we will invest 1 billion euros over the next four years, targeting on the, um, water resource management and water production to enable people <coughs> to have good water for their daily consumption. So that all variety provides some of the examples that are needed to address these challenges. And uh, here um, we see four areas where we need to focus in terms of solutions. So the first one is a scale. This was mentioned by you, Mr. Minister, the extra mile. Scale is both at the same time bringing more volumes, billions of euros, billions of dollars into food production, into productivity. But at the same time, it is bringing 100 euros, 50 euros, sometimes a little more to farmers, isolated farmers in remote places. So that, that this is one of the complexity that we have to address to, together. Um, bringing at the same time big volumes and small volumes to farmers so that they can be able to produce and increase their production. Um, the second issue that we have to focus on is value of nature. As long as a dead tree or a dead animal has more value than a living animal or a living tree, we'll have a challenge that needs to be solved. And this is the interest we find in carbon markets, bringing value to reforestation, bringing value to forests, and bringing value to the biodiversity that will come back to those places. It's important in our view to, uh, you mentioned the systemic approach plan that needs to be put in place. It's both true for the uh, finance, agriculture, technical, all what we all work collectively together, but it's also important to be taken into consideration when we look at nature as a system. It's a system with animals, with trees, and we need to see how the expertise that we provide the expertise which is provided with ADB can contribute to the development of this system. Um, third, it's um, partnering and deploying innovations as far and as deeply as we can. Um, we launched with the support of other bilateral institutions, the finance in common system that was four years ago. Um, we will, with the Brazilian G20 presidency, launch an innovation lab uh, next uh, May in uh, Rio, focusing on four areas, carbon markets, local currencies. Um, we will also focus on nature-based solutions. And we also want to take into consideration contingency clauses and uh, debt for nature swaps. Innovation in finance at the service of food production, at the service of the fight against climate change is a very good option and needs to be pursued as strongly as possible. And bringing in 530 public development institutions is, in our view, a good way then to deploy and to have as many institutions as possible to implement those innovations and those uh, solutions. And uh, finally, I want to commend the work that we do with uh, ADB, with Ramesh and uh, his uh, teams. We've been partnering and uh, we are very proud of uh, the work that we are collectively conducting. Three billion euros dollars of investment is the current aim that we have in our memorandum of uh, co-financing cooperation. We want to go much higher than this. And it's important to say that standardization, harmonization comes from that kind of co-financing agreement that we signed together. We need same kind of standards. We need to have environmental and social audits being conducted in a very similar way be it in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, or in Europe. And this is what we are focusing on with partners such as um, ADB. Thanks very much, Bertrand. It's really a source of optimism that there are these innovative financing um, uh, initiatives that are taking place. 
uh, and IFD and ADB are at the forefront of that. Uh, Ramesh, I was wondering if I could turn to you and to respond. Uh, it seems like there are uh, funds being available. Uh, how do we in ADB make sure that that money is spent well, especially in an area where, uh, as, you've, uh, as you've heard, uh, it really requires uh, us to work across different sectors because it's not just production, it's also how to use uh, the, uh, the, the resource as well and uh, how to make sure consumers are able to consume it. It requires really a cross-sectoral issue. What are the challenges that uh, you see going forward as we try to scale up, as Bertrand mentioned, our, our own initiatives? Thank you uh, so much, Manny, and good morning to everyone. Fantastic insights from the uh, Minister, Glenn Bertrand. Uh, I'm sure Purnima, we've been working very closely with IFPRI as well. Uh, all, all the points, just to highlight uh, you know, one or two uh, words from what each of them said, um, referring to Glenn, uh, there are lots of system interdependencies. Uh, you know, what happens in agriculture obviously is shaped by what's happening in uh, other sectors. What the minister said, it's not just food production. We need to look at econom economy-wide implications and, and what is needed elsewhere in the system. And um, Betron's point uh, on preserving natural capital uh, while meeting the new challenges, not only preserving what is there, but also bringing lost value, which is very, very critical, particularly in the biodiversity uh, context. Uh, in, in ADB, clearly all these uh, issues are interconnected. We are approaching the whole issue of food security uh, from a multidimensional and uh, multi-sectoral perspective, uh, but particularly uh, some of these issues that on, on natural capital uh, and system interdependencies are also so complex uh, that, and you asked the question, Manny, how do we make sure that the money that we put in goes longer and farther? Uh, how can we leverage uh, both technical uh, expertise as well as uh, money, particularly in terms of private capital that can uh, come into these areas? Let me mention a few points uh, of focus for ADB in this context. Uh, first is how do we ensure uh, adequate access uh, and affordability is very critical. As uh, Ching Feng mentioned, food prices have been going up, particularly rice prices have been going up in uh, parts of Asia. That's very critical in the uh, short term for us to look at. Uh, equity considerations are very important, and this takes us to the second dimension, which is uh, social protection. Uh, there are short-term issues as we have faced in the aftermath of the, um, you know, the recent crisis. Um, clearly, there are vulnerable segments of the population that need to be supported. You, w once you look at that, then you get into the fiscal space. Uh, do countries have adequate fiscal space? Do they have uh, social protection schemes and measures? Uh, the third, related to um, the, the uh, second point I just mentioned, we heard uh, what uh, Ismahane and um, uh, Lawrence spoke on nutrition. Our footprint and nutrition space for ADB uh, is actually, uh, and in fact, looking at the entire multilateral system uh, is quite nascent. We need to invest a lot more uh, in the space, and this is something that came out very clearly at the uh, recently concluded Food Security Forum that we had in um, ADB. And, and fourth, uh, you, you know, these are all short-term, but some of them could also be medium-term considerations. Then you start going into what Betro mentioned. Uh, the, the bridge between the short to the medium and the longer term, which is the climate considerations. And here uh, you obviously look at adaptation and resilience, which has been much, much harder. But this is uh, a sector where you have lots of pathways for building and boosting uh, adaptation and resilience. And then um, you start going into other sectors. Uh, we um, heard, again, one of the, the, the president of uh, uh, Marshall Island speaking about uh, you, you need um, other transport infrastructure that needs to be built. Uh, sustainable energy systems need to be there. All of these new solutions also need adequate investments in uh, human capital. Uh, and then another uh, sectoral dimension is it's not just the public sector, uh, but what can we gain uh, from bringing in private sector uh, or from uh, looking for ADB. Our private sector has done quite well and, and also working with uh, AFD. 
Uh, we've been leveraging a lot of investments through policy reforms as well, but there is a lot more that needs to be done. And then finally, the last dimension is no one country, no one institution can do all this alone. We need lots and lots of partnerships. Uh, so AFD, we've been working very, very closely. But in the uh, research and knowledge ecosystem, there is a lot of science behind what is going on. And we as a bank, uh, we are not adequately investing in this, and we need to invest more. Uh, so at the Food Security Forum a uh, couple of weeks back, we signed a comprehensive MOU with uh, CGIA or Systems, and we look forward to working very, very closely with all the partners. Let me leave it there for now, Manny. No, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Ramesh. And uh, I am so glad you are in charge overseeing all the sectors because now you'll be, be, you'll be held responsible for a lot of these uh, promises, which I'm sure you'll be able to handle. For Diva, let me turn to you. You've heard uh, a lot of, uh, uh, of the issues being raised. But in particular, uh, some of us have tended in the past to equate food security with freedom from starvation and hunger. And what we've heard is that that is not as particularly narrow view of things. Uh, could you, ref, uh, from your uh, experience, reflect on what are the priorities in terms of how to ensure real food security from a more holistic point of view? Uh, thanks, Manny. Firstly, uh, thank you for having me here. Great privilege to be here on behalf of IFPRI uh, and the CGIR. Um, and also, as, you know, as someone trained in nutrition, just a real pleasure to hear my sector get the kind of attention that it is getting for good reason. Um, we know that malnutrition lies at the heart of the, the great health challenges that we face around the world today. We also know that uh, diets, what people choose to eat, are really central to solving many of these challenges. And I think we are seeing a real coming together now in that perspective in terms of recognizing the power of diets and the choices people make to transform food systems from you know, from that side of things, from a, from a demand side of things. Um, I mean, in short, our food is making people sick and our food is making the planet sick. And so we really have to, to crack this nut. But I think as we think about solving the challenge of food security itself, which is a very people-oriented challenge, if we are really serious about um, the kinds of food systems transformations that, you know, give us the long-term benefits that we, we care about here for people and the planet, we're going to have to firstly reframe how we think about food security beyond calories. Um, thinking about uh, diets as a primary entry point and the quality of diets in particular, I think can, can give us that entry point to reframe how we think about this. Uh, and when we do that, we realize that in fact, um, a majority of the world is facing a real crisis in terms of the quality of diets. In particular, we've been doing a lot of work on, on a metric um, around the affordability of healthy diets. And I, and I really like that metric because in a sense, it connects issues of quality in terms of how we measure healthy diets. Uh, it connects it to how people engage with the food system by, by pinning it on the affordability of healthy diets. And in doing so, it gives us multiple entry points for transformation. It does make our lives more difficult in terms of the politics of, in a sense, acknowledging that 3 billion people today can't afford a healthy diet is very different from the politics of acknowledging that you know, 207, uh, 770 million can't, um, can't afford enough calories, right? Um, but I think what it gives us is the entry points to say it isn't just about food supply and food prices as we see it in the markets, but that incomes and affordability as experienced by, by people is what, is what matters here. And, and we have plenty of tools and strategies in our hands for how to do that. Um, and so maybe I'll just you know, uh, speak a little bit to that, perhaps using the example of, of Bangladesh, Honorable Minister, which is a country where we've had the great privilege of working with um, you know, policymakers for the last three decades in identifying solutions. Um, so there are some really critical entry points if you take a consumer and people-oriented perspective to the transformation agenda. It, it, requi it really requires us to you know, think well beyond a supply-oriented perspective, right? So if you take that people-oriented perspective, I think what we see is entry points related to safety nets. Ramesh, I was so happy to hear you talk about that. We have phenomenal results from Bangladesh on a nutrition-linked uh, social safety net effort uh, with, with the World Food Program and the government of Bangladesh you know, delivering mul multiple years of short-term, medium-term, and long-term impact. Now, our teams are looking at eight-year long-run impacts. 
we have an example of an agriculture linked nutrition and gen gender sensitive investment again with the government of Bangladesh. So, you know, I think lots of really important entry points there, but it truly requires us to take a demand oriented transformation lens. And if we do that, then I think we, we, we start to open the, you know, just open the box up a little bit more to creative solutions. And there's plenty of evidence at IFPRI and in the CJR to support that. Very happy to bring that to the table. Let me hand it back to you. Thanks a lot, Purnima, for bringing back uh, our attention to uh, people and demanders who are actually going to be consuming uh, the food. Uh, Mr. Minister, you've heard this panel uh, offer a lot of assistance uh, in terms of money from both uh, the bilateral and the multilateral side in terms of ideas. Uh, we have uh, Purnima and Glenn here talking about some of the innovations that have been done. From Bangladesh's point of view, what would be your priorities in terms of what types of assistance you would need from these well-intentioned folks at this panel? What are the top one or two priorities you'd ask for, either in terms of uh, money or ideas? Well, uh, uh, the most important thing in our view is the people that if uh, enough food is not being provided or is not available in the system, the, the way the production and distribution are organized, then give it to the people, those who are, who are not able to find food. You, you provide uh, food to them and they will respond and the whole system will find a new equilibrium. So we have shown, Bangladesh has shown that uh, this really works and the number of people is not uh, uh, you know, too small. This, you are talking about millions of people that we are providing, Sheikh Hasina's government is providing food uh, uh, to millions of people. Those who are not uh, able to find food, you know, give it to them and then they will uh, return you back. They will buy their uh, 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 efforts, they will return the, uh, uh, and the food that you have given to them, the government or uh, the system has given to those people. So this is the way to uh, overcome the uh, shortage of food or in the, whatever the reason that uh, the system uh, cannot deliver or has not delivered. But uh, if you really uh, I mean, uh, the imbalance should be removed, whatever way, whichever way. So then it will uh, pay you back ultimately. So this is what has happened in Bangladesh. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, so uh, Ramesh and uh, Bertrand, uh, uh, distribution really is what the minister uh, seems to be talking about, that it's not just about production. Uh, what, what are the things that our institutions like the ADB and RFD and uh, others do to ensure that food gets to the people directly, as the minister pointed out, and not just been made of it, being made available. Bertha? Well, thank you very much for this uh, difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> um, referring to the presentation we had while opening the session, there was uh, somebody talking about uh, the private sector. And it's interesting because I had a discussion yesterday night with the head of uh, Carrefour, which is a, a local chain market. It's a French uh, company that has uh, various and uh, numerous uh, stores in uh, Georgia. And uh, he, uh, among his, what he, so he is specialized into buying things and distributing them across the country. Um, what he does also is contracting with local farmers and offering a long-term perspective to those farmers, ensuring that they will get a fair price over one, two, three years, and uh, then securing the food production and ensuring them against climate change, against the increase of, uh, of, uh, of uh, prices also uh, in a way. So this is one area where I think that ADB, um, IFD and others institutions partnering with countries. Countries have definitely a very significant role to play in uh, the organization of that very specific type of markets 
It cannot be run by the private sector itself, at least it's my belief. But we need to rely on private actors who have this ability to distribute uh, in a country, to have a, a small operations, small stores, small stores, and at the, st the same time also big stores for big cities, obviously. But there are very interesting partnerships that can be built by actors like us with this type of distributors and with this type of actors connecting farmers um, markets through this type of layers. So that's not the whole answer, but I think that sure. at least it's, it's one part of the answer that can be brought forward. Thank you. Ramesh? Trump mentioned the private sector has got a huge role to play. I see Martin Lamont, uh, the head of our private sector uh, operations and food systems. Uh, I think, you know, we do on, on our um, large scale food systems transformation type of projects, we do have a missing middle or a lost mile connectivity issue. At one point that came very clearly at the Food Security Forum uh, is the need to focus a lot more on smallholders. Uh, so we do a lot of things, the large scale infra infrastructure, irrigation type of projects, and even the farm to market type of investments we make, but we do have that lost mile challenge in terms of going beyond that and connecting the producers to the market. So I think on, uh, if you look at our sovereign operations, we need to look at the distributional issues uh, a lot more. But that's why we are very happy that ADB has got this one roof advantage working very closely between the sovereign and the non-sovereign operations, which will become even stronger uh, in, in the years to come. And I suppose the infrastructure investments that we're making are also going to ensure that uh, of goods flow freely and, and uh, at a good price. Yeah. Uh, I'll turn back to Purnima and Glenn in, in a minute, but first I think I want to turn, see whether there are any questions that are coming up in pigeonhole uh, from uh, the ether. Yes, indeed, the questions are coming up. I think the team wants to quickly uh, showcase the pigeonhole uh, to tell others who have not yet put the questions in how to do it. There are a couple of questions here already. Could you summarize a couple? Uh, yes. So uh, in part, uh, some of the questions have already been answered, but I'll read it all out to them so the panel can decide what to answer. Private sector, not government, is the one that provides agriculture inputs and produces, transports, and distributes food. How can ADB and governments increase private sector investments in agri-food? Second question is? How can we convince governments to repurpose the 600 billion of subsidies to agriculture away from fuel and fertilizer towards rewarding farmers for climate resilient and nature positive practices? Question number three. To strengthen food security, what would be the most urgent areas, capacity building initiatives and trainings should target to develop cap capacities of policymakers? Uh, so, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, let me turn to uh, actually put uh, Glenn and Praniva on the spot a little bit, and maybe you could address perhaps this issue of capacity building, which is critical in all of development, and you coming from think tanks, universities, uh, what are the biggest priorities do you think you would ask from organizations and governments in terms of building capacity to ensure that the right things happen? So, Praniva? Well, we are trying to really operate in a space of complex problems. And, and to me, this is a little bit like, uh, you know, when we try to attack these challenges, it's like the bl blind men and the elephant challenges. Each of us sees, you know, only the part of the elephant that we are closest to. And so to really tackle a wicked problem, I, I think, to me, the primary um, entry point has to be that we see the problem in its whole. And, and we really start to understand the... Um, the systems dynamics changes that occur as you start to move one part or the other. You know, just as an example, I think the discussion on private sector is is absolutely critical. It's where most of the food is is produced. I mean, food is fundamentally a private enterprise. But what we've seen in the last many years is the emergence of food as a primary one of the top four commercial determinants of poor health. Right? Top four. The other three are fossil fuels, alcohol, and tobacco. That, that's where, th that's the, the great company that, that, food, that the food industry is sitting in in terms of public health. And so how do we, you know, engage in this transformation, bring private sector along is, is, a, is to me an elephant and blind man kind of, a, kind of a problem, right? So primary entry point for capacity building is that the second is, is data. We have 
really do not have the data systems that we need to be able to see the system in its entirety, to be able to understand you know, what happens when you move one thing uh, to the other parts of the system. So to me, these are two really critical parts um, and as we look forward on, on capacity building. Thanks. Thanks for knowing. Glenn? So I'm glad this third question came up because it, it's really something, you mentioned my book, Universal Food Security. It was very clear that we, we know what to do. We've got, you know, we, we understand the importance of improving productivity, of connecting to markets, of reducing post-harvest losses, of changing diets, of having better social protection systems. But why isn't it happening to the extent that we want it to happen? And I really came down to this idea that it requires uh, enlightened leadership to basically step up, mobilize the resources, mobilize the capacity, and, and deploy them in, in ways that would you know, have these positive outcomes that we all want. And you know, I think it's wonderful to have a Minister of Finance up on that discussing food security. Years ago, it was all Minister of Agriculture you know, and Minister of Food, perhaps. But having a Minister of Finance here talking about food security is great. And having a Prime Minister talking about it is even greater. And, and ministers of foreign affairs, because so much of this is about international cooperation and sort of regional initiatives. So I, I think this sort of broadening kind of whole of government, um, whole of society approach, bringing in private sector, third sector, educational institutions is, is, is all part of what I think we need a new generation really of practitioner leaders, people who know how to get things done because much of the know-how, we don't have everything, and I agree we have to continue to innovate, but a lot of this can be put into practice uh, now. And, and so I'm, I'm really hoping that uh, we invest more uh, to bring this new generation through that understands food security in its much sort of broader, integrated, interconnected, multidisciplinary, multi-sectorally um, sort of connected these systems, um, because that's not the traditional education systems. It's normally very narrowly sort of focusing on specific disciplines and sectors, but um, having a more holistic approach, I think, is really important to bring this new sort of generation forward to address the complexity of food security in a challenging climate. Thank you. Time is running short, uh, and Ramesh, I see you're trying to uh, oh, get my attention so you can say something. But no, so very quickly you. over to you. On, on capacity building, just to supplement what Purnima and uh, Glenn said, uh, climate adaptation to resilience is very, very complex issues. So we do need to provide more training, more capacity building. Second related area is transition finance. Uh, lots of innovative financial uh, you know, techniques are available, but uh, particularly those who are working on food systems are not familiar with these. So these are the two areas that we are focusing on. Since I have the mic on the private sector question, uh, Manny, uh, creating enabling environment is so critical. Uh, so this is something we focus on working with AFD uh, across many DMCs in the region. We've been working in uh, policy reforms, policy, institutional, legal reforms. In the Philippines, we read recently an agriculture markets competitiveness program, which actually has a fundamental aim uh, how can we bring in more private capital? And second is, can, how can we leverage our capital overall more effectively? Can we, for example, look at more guarantees, first loss type of uh, investments? Our private sector operations will play a very, very critical role. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, but I wonder if you could reflect just on that. You mentioned Carrefour earlier. Um, what are the top priorities to ensure that the public sector is working in the right way? with incentivizing the private sector to do the kinds of things that need to be done? Maybe two things to try to answer that question. The first one referring to the second question, how can we convince government to repurpose the 600 billion and so on? Um, I think that part of the answer lies into the value which is given to living ecosystems. As long as those ecosystems, and that was one of my point, don't have a specific value, it is not taken into account when factoring um, and, and, and calculating the cost of a given production of a given system. If you give value to worms in soil, if you give value to birds in forests, if you give value to any kind of living things, then you have to build economic models and target subsidies that will take this into consideration. 
So that's probably the biggest way to reorient capital flows towards sustainable, resilient, and long-term uh, systems. So that's one of, uh, one of the things I wanted to, to say. The second one is how can we, and to respond to your question, how can we um, factor both the enabling environment that Ramesh was mentioning, having a public sector, public policies, sound policies that gives a long-term perspective to private actors, and how we can convince private players to invest into research, to invest into science. This is also one of the points that was made uh, today, how we can factor science and finance together to bring solutions that will convince private actors that they can invest uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, because this is what is needed today to provide food security and to answer to those challenges. So th those, those are the two points I would make. Great, thanks. Uh, we're just about out of time. Ms. Uh, was there? Just if you can include one more question, it's a gender related one, okay. if we have the time. We don't have the time, so, sorry. <laughs> but Mr. Minister, I want to give you, because I want to give time to the minister, uh, to a last reflection, a last word from you. Uh, you heard Glenn speak eloquently about enlightened leadership and uh, the experience of Bangladesh in particular. Uh, do you have uh, a lesson for other countries on how to instill this enlightenment among the leaders uh, that uh, might help uh, people in this audience think about how to get the kind of change that is sometimes very difficult to get in this? Well, we have uh, shown the, uh, what we can do, you know, to, uh, enlightened leadership, what it can do. And uh, the result is uh, before your eyes, before everybody's eyes. So I think, uh, uh, sometimes, you know, despite the various arguments, various ways, then you try to establish your uh, point. We have, uh, you know, our leader, Shagasina, has gone directly to the pro problem. And she has shown that, yes, it is possible. So the, the answer is very clear. So you have to be, uh, you have to really listen to the people, you know, the people the uh, the farmers uh, what they are doing and this is how she has done it she has shown shown you a particular way a hard way so therefore bangladesh's way let me put it that way so uh, results are before everybody's eyes so i think uh, our uh, our presentation uh, proves the point thank you very much mr and you've brought us back to the, ensure that we work on not just supply, but on the demand side, bring it back to the people, uh, as all of the other panelists mentioned. So we've run out of time, unfortunately. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panel for a very interesting and productive session. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. We're sorry we couldn't include some of the questions, but thank you for your participation. Thank you. Thank you.